If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is known as the Kenergizer. For over a third of a century, Ken Krell has inspired thousands of people all over the world by sharing powerful ways to create wealth, prosperity, and happiness in their lives. A master at marketing strategy and business growth, Ken has a unique ability to detect money-making opportunities in most business structures. He's a well-respected expert in niche marketing strategies, particularly in the real estate and mortgage financing businesses. Until recently, Ken traveled around the world selling millions of dollars in goods and services on both physical and digital stages. His passion is helping people create more prosperous businesses and fulfilling lives. Ken, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to the show. And thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. It's a pleasure to be with you, Susan. And uh, I'm thrilled to reconnect with you after so many years. I know. Before we went on the air, Ken showed me pictures of us in Mexico, where we were on a National Speakers Association trip. And whoa, it took me back many years. So it's so much fun. I Ken, it was 1917 <laughs> when we went there. Just amazing. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's scary. <laughs> Both you and I were a lot younger then. What can I say? We, yeah, we were younger, but we're still sexy, baby. Good. I like it. I'll take that anytime. Ken, you're known as the Kenergizer. How on earth did you get that, that name? <laughs> it's a great question. And it, I'm glad you asked it, actually, because people don't usually ask that question. And for you, it'll mean something because of our NSA association. I think it was Pete Johnson that actually coined that for me, if memory serves me correctly. It just sort of fit. And it's, you know, I now own the domain and we copyrighted the term and all this sort of things. People seem to think I have a lot of energy. I'm just tired. But people <laughs> are like, where do you get all this energy, Ken? I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of how it came into place. And it's been a long time since I've used that moniker. I think it's fun. And I forgot to mention to our listeners that you're calling all the way from, or you're speaking to us all the way from Sydney, Australia. And it's four o'clock in the morning. Hats off to you to being so dedicated to want to do this so early in the morning. I'm thrilled. It's yeah. always exciting when we've got international guests or guests who are calling from international venues. I'm going to jump in for a second on this because I think it's an important distinction that people should know is that, yes, in writing a book, you know, it's typically a passive type of thing and you sell the book and they're gone, right? which is we're going to talk about making sure that never happens again. But when you run a digital type of business or a global type of business, your audience, while you're sleeping, they're awake. A lot of them are. And to recognize that what you have really is global reach, global effect, there are times when it's going to be really inconvenient to serve the audience you want to serve. But if you make that commitment, then you perform. I run a three-day event called Pride, produce ridiculously irresistible digital events. Unfortunately, the first Pride I did started at 1 a.m. for me, and it was, I was already up all night, three nights in a row. You want to talk about jet lag? <laughs> That's jet lag. That certainly um, is. Yeah. You know, so 4 a.m., do I love waking up at 4 a.m.? No. For you, I could not wait to show you those pictures. So yeah, I was thrilled to get up at 4 a.m. to rekindle our adventure in Mexico. But I think it is important for your listeners to know that they do have the option of serving people across the planet. And that does sometimes involve inconvenient times. Well, that's a great segue, Ken, because I know that you talk about creating world-class winning digital events. And even if you don't have a list, if you don't have a signature story, if you don't have any money. Okay. So that begs the question, 
how do you do that? Take it away. Tell us because I lo- listeners I want it. to know. <laughs> let's, be, let's be happy. Take my course. Yeah, I love when people say that. I can't tell you anything. You got to take my course. That is one of the most annoying things that I've ever heard. Here's the thing. I've been speaking for, good Lord, nearly 40 years, 39 years at last count, which just amazes me since I think I'm only 35 years old anyway. And when I first began speaking, I was speaking on other people's stages as their sales speaker. So I was teaching real estate stuff all over the planet and mostly over US and Canada at that point. And when I left that particular company, because I've been with them for like eight, nine years, something like that, while I was a hero in their organization, people were waiting in line to come to my courses because I made it fun and we did all these crazy things in the hotel rooms and stuff. When I left there, no one knew who I was. And so being the superstar within that one organization and then being nobody, having no list, and I didn't save a lot of money back then because everything I had I put into real estate. So there wasn't liquidity. I had to find a way to put myself back into the green, start having revenue come in. At that point, I was living in Atlanta. I needed to find a way to play it. So what I did, and this is still true today, although not anywhere near as profitable as it used to be, I did what is now known as a virtual summit. I found 10 real estate speakers that had products for sale. I approached each of them and I said, how would you like to be exposed to your nine top competitors (laughs) lists, clients? They all said yes. We had each of them effectively do a webinar with me. I hosted it just as you're hosting me right now, Susan. And we sold uh, recordings. At that time, we gave it away for free. We sold recordings for $49 and they all had to promote. And at that time, people did promote. These days, not so much. We sold literally thousands of dollars of recording packages and so on before the thing ever started because people mailed. I built a list from nothing using other people's lists because, again, they mailed. I hosted the events and I didn't have a product of my own. They sold. We split profits at that point 50-50, as you would see if you're going to speak on someone's stage as a selling person. So I made revenue from that. And at the same time, since it was still real estate, which I've been teaching and investing in actively, I could add value to the conversation. It wasn't just, hi, this is Ken, here's Tim, and see you later. It was, I was able to come in and edify the speaker as well. And so that edified me to the list. So I then ultimately created expert value. I was associated now with with 10 other experts also, had revenue, had a list, and now had a recording product as well, a recording package of the 10 events. That's how I began my business. And you can still do it today. Yeah. Take us through how we would do that today, because I think overall, there are some things that obviously are the same, but then there's a lot that's different because obviously the digital environment has changed so much. So how could we do it today? I'll take you to current events and well, current within months. When things really hit with the whole COVID scenario, a lot of people were frustrated and panicked, and some still are, about what to do. A lot of speakers, unfortunately, aren't speaking anymore because they don't know how to make the transition. They're afraid to, old dog, no new tricks, all that kind of thing was going on. And I had friends that wouldn't pivot, you know, people that were in the the hospitality industry that were just frozen and would not listen to me because I was a local friend. You know, you're never a hero at home, right? I decided that I would create an event that would celebrate the opportunities that are available through the COVID scenario. And of course, acknowledging those that haven't lived through to see opportunity due to unfortunate, and that's such a horrible word to say, unfortunate, death is not unfortunate. But we created something, when I say we, my team, we created something called Opportunity Thon, which was a 28 and a half hour nonstop marathon geared towards exploring what opportunities existed and still exist throughout the pandemic. I brought in 55 speakers, Susan, 55 of them. All of them spoke for free. I had people such as Joel Bauer, Les Brown, who opened things up for us. And it was all digital. I hosted it, but I didn't even speak. I didn't have a product to sell. And I made sure that the speakers pretty much didn't have a product to sell either because I didn't want to have it be a pitch a thon because it just didn't make any sense. But some people did. And the deal for the revenue side of it was that while it was a 50 50 split, they had to make an offer that was so stupid that the audience would say, thank you so much, as opposed to, oh God, here they go again, which is a really important distinction because you don't want to be known for just a pitch fester because you'll lose a list really fast. 
You've got to be known for service and for caring about your audience and for loving on them so much that they can't help but love you back. That event was the precursor of a multi-million dollar business, quite frankly, because what it did was it cemented relationships. And I think in today's marketplace, Susan, it's the relationship that's going to make you wealthy, not the initial sale to the customer or the client. It's the relationship with those that will ultimately promote you and share your message with others so that they come to you. And that's what happened. It cemented a deep relationship with a number of of my fellow presenters and rekindled things that people haven't talked to in years came on to be part of this whole thing. That is how my business grew or regrew as I made the shift because I've been on stage for, for so long. My digital stuff stopped for a little while just because I was doing stage stuff for others here in Australia and throughout Asia. That's still something you can do, recognizing that in the old days when people would mail regularly for you and audiences responded and email worked and all those memories of when it was easy because people weren't doing it then. Now everyone's doing it. You don't have a partnership that will mail for you or even if they do, the lists don't respond like they used to. So now you have to rely on much deeper relationships and more creativity to get the results that you want, but you still can't. And a book is a fantastic way to do it. It obviously begs again that question, how to do it if all the ways of doing it before don't work anymore? Because we are, we're flooded with emails. And even though you might be doing an email campaign on behalf of somebody else, getting people to read these emails and then do we organize our own event or are we looking for opportunity on other people's digital stages? Which answer, would you recommend? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I'm teaching people to do is to produce their own digital events. In fact, I took down the domain amazingdigitalevents.com to really edify what we're talking about. I'm a big fan of producing your own events because at the end of the day, we have to accept responsibility for our own audience. Think back to the times when we were on stages. How many times have you walked into an, a ballroom to be told you're going to have, oh, 500 people in the ballroom and, and you have seven? It is not a fun thing, especially when you're not, you're not working off of fee paid, you're working off of sales. That's a pretty uncomfortable thing. And so many of my contemporaries have had that experience. Being in charge of your own event, I think, gives you a lot more power than being a guest on someone else's. But Even if you go digital and they don't get the audience, you're not leaving your living room. I mean, it's four o'clock in the morning and yes, I am wearing shorts, but you know, you could be in your pajamas. You really have the the flexibility digitally to not have the level of inconvenience and risk. But yeah, I'd rather have you produce your own events rather than be a guest on others. But that's just only because I like to be more in control. Being a guest on someone else's event can still be very profitable. And and again, I'm going to advocate selling your services. I'm going to advocate not just and using the book as a lead magnet and selling the heck out of your coaching program, your consulting program, your mastermind, whatever that happens to be, your, your high ticket offer. I'm all about that. And that allows you to monetize without a heck of a lot of risk. If you're going to produce your own, Susan, the misconception that a lot of people have is that it's expensive and confusing and you don't have what you need and it's going to cost you a fortune to produce. And the answer to that is balderdash. I haven't used that word in a long time. (laughs) Because you have what you need. The fact that you're able to listen to us right now tells me you have everything that you need. If you have an iPhone and you can get onto Zoom, you got it. You don't even really need to have a great camera. I did my first event with my Mac camera on the computer. And I think I just used the actual microphone on the Macintosh as well. Now I'm using a different mic. And when I do my events, I use a different camera. But I'll tell you, my first three-day event that I did digitally, just as if you'd go to a three-day hotel event, I shot it with my GoPro, literally. You don't have to spend a fortune and you don't have to have all the bells and whistles that Tony Robbins has been using. You know, He's got a multi-million dollar studio. In this, he's now in his second, maybe third studio at this point down in Florida. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be crazy. People want your message. The misconception of it being hard and confusing is just an unknowing fear because I demystify all of it. And in fact, in my events now, I've kind of made it a point that I don't even do fancy backdrops at all. I have two palm trees that I use. (laughs) You know, it's just really, it's to demonstrate that you don't have to be fancy schmancy. You really don't because people want the message. They don't need all the Hollywood. So the big thing with that, Ken, is getting the audience 
What I'd love you to address is some of the marketing techniques that you use to sure. get people to these digital events. I want to reflect on one thing because when we talk about getting the show up, a lot of people are all of the size matters mentality. And, you know, listen, the bigger the audience, typically you think you can sell more, which is certainly true. There's been a misconception in digital that you can't convert as well as you can physically, which is also completely not true <laughs> at all. Uh, my last event, I converted at 40%. Typically on a stage deal, I'm, I'll convert between 25 and 30. Hitting 40 was not so shabby. You don't have to go wild and crazy to fill a room. I'll get to that in a sec. I will tell you that one of my clients took immediate action. I love when people I, learn something and then do something immediately. It, it inspires me as I think it probably inspires everyone listening too. It's like people actually listen to what you're saying. Holy mackerel. She went and did her first event. She had 11 registered, 11 at $25 a head. So listen up, listeners. <laughs> 11 people, eight showed up. And um, she's like, oh, great. What, how's this going to work? Her product was a consulting service at 5000 bucks a month. Of the eight that were there, two signified they wanted her programming. She ended up making a deal payment plan on one of them at 18000 bucks for the year. Her cost to produce it was $700 something. No, I'm sorry, 684 or something like that, less than 700 bucks. And she made $18,000. She produced it in two and a half weeks and she did everything wrong. When I looked at what she was doing, I was like, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, your sales page is ugly. So the point is that we'll get into some of the techniques that we're using, but you don't have to have giant numbers to make giant numbers, which is delightful to take the pressure off. Absolutely. Because uh, I've always been of the opinion, oh, well, and I've seen it that you had hundreds and hundreds of people on an event. And that's the opportunity for you to sell more, but you're saying, no, it's sort of quality versus quantity. It's that. And also it's taking the pressure off of your first few events because you don't have to go wild and crazy. I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, your first event is going to be your worst event. And by the way, it's also going to be your best event until your next event, because you got to start someplace. You can't do your second event until you've done your first Taking the pressure off of doing the home run on your first event is going to be really important. My first Pride event was, we had 66 people registered, which to me was humiliating when you consider that I'm teaching people how to fill events and this and that and so on. So I ended up calling a friend of mine and I was just, I was really down and out. I was like, this is terrible. It's going to be really embarrassing. And he said to me, well, what was your marketing budget? I said, well, I spent nothing. He said, wait a minute, you got 66 people registered and you spent nothing on marketing? I said, well, yeah. He said, Dude, <laughs> you know, I have friends that are spending thousands on Facebook ads and they're getting like 40 to 50 people. You spent nothing, you got 66, you should be dancing. We generated over hundred thousand dollars from that event. Yeah, you don't have to spend a lot of money and I'll give you my biggest secret weapon right now because it's the best thing ever. And it's not Facebook ads because that can be very expensive and can be very frustrating based on time of year. I mean, I remember just going through Christmas, our ad prices skyrocketed and it was very disturbing to see money going out and not a whole lot coming in during those peaks and valleys and so on. But the best way to do it for me has been, believe it or not, joint ventures and giveaways. If you can align yourself with someone who has a product launch or something that's being sold that is really similar to what you're doing, then that's a great way to play. I'll give you an example. Pride originally back in July of 2020 sold for $2,000, it's 1997 and I sold it out. We could peg it at that price. Actually, I had sold a similar event and sold that out five years earlier for $5,000. It was my biggest, I remember making the pivot to going from like a $500 product to $5,000 and it was freaky to get to that high ticket offer and believe I was worth $5,000. I'm not sure I'll have time to address that, but getting over yourself and recognizing that you are worth that money not just for a $20 book, but now you're worth $20,000 for your program. That's an important pivot to make. My friend, Sharon Sheldon, who does an amazing job of producing private label programming, was releasing a course on how to do virtual events. And I was like, well, wait a minute, Sharon, those are digital events. Those are online events. I didn't call them digital events because they're real, just delivered digitally online. They're not virtual, they're real. And I said, Sharon, how would you like to give people my $2,000 three-day live program delivered digitally as a bonus for buying your $97 offer. All they have to do is pay for the shipping of our swag box because that's a critical piece to the experience. She's like, yeah, of course. She added the bonus, the $2,000 bonus. People paid 
$50 for the materials fee for the swag box plus shipping. And we did really well because we had a few people buy my, at that time, $10,000 program. It's more now. And she got people that were thrilled to pieces for the value. And she sold more of what she was selling because people were buying the bonus to get her product or buying her product to get my bonus. So it was a win for everybody. She put 35 people into that course. And I made so far 20 grand on that. Just that alone, it was well worth it. So now I look for people who can benefit from what I'm doing, add that as a value add to what they're doing. It helps them. It helps me. And what's my marketing cost? Zero. It's not even that I'm paying for or splitting a lot of profit. I gave her half the profits of our VIP recording packages and so on. But otherwise, I mean, she got her sales and was able to offer something that she could never offer before. That's fantastic. So, That's yeah. absolutely fantastic. Because you rightly said, this didn't cost you anything, but yet you were able to reap the benefits of your generosity and helping her helped you. Hey, that sounds like a good deal to me. It's a win-win all the way. Bingo. And he, but here's the distinction I want to make sure everyone gets. And that is that the giveaway was in direct relation and synchronicity, 25 cent word, technical term here, write that one down. It was in synchronicity with what she was offering and what I wanted as an audience. If you're going to give away something that brings you an audience that is not a potential buyer for what you're doing, then it doesn't serve you. You have to have that right fit audience. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So it's got to fit for both parties. Perfect. Love talking about mistakes, Ken. <laughs> what? <laughs> Maybe you have one or two you could share with our listeners. You got a few days? Yeah. You know, I will tell you. And this is one of the things that I think sets me apart from a lot of people that run events. It certainly was when I run a three-day event, for example, my Signature Pride event, I open the kimono. People see how to produce event, an event while I'm doing an event, and I show them all the good, bad, and ugly so that you can learn from that. And I call that wisdom transfer, by the way. I've kind of coined that term. I think biggest mistakes, certainly from the promotional side, are assuming that your experts know what the heck they're talking about. Last year, I was counting on a recommended Facebook organization or Facebook marketing company, rather, to fill my event for me. And after dropping $7,000 to them between their fees and Facebook ad fees, we had zero to show for it. And I was two weeks away from my event with like no audience. The combination of humiliation and loss of funds and loss of revenue, because it would have been a half million dollar event, was horrible. So watching what they do, and if they're not performing cut the cable immediately. Stay right on top of that immediately. Don't anticipate that it will turn around with more time and more money. Watch, watch, watch like you're watching the surgery of your two-year-old daughter. And if you don't have a two-year-old daughter, pretend you do. But it really is that critical. Don't start with big numbers. Start with small numbers because if you, if you want to make the splash and have the home run because your ego says that you got to do a thousand people in your audience or whatever, no. Start small and then grow one by one. And I think that's a much better way to play than trying to be all things. The other mistake too is forgetting that you're there to serve your audience, not to serve yourself, but to serve your audience, which isn't to say that you don't craft your program to serve your needs and what your non-negotiables are. Like I don't really want to do 4 a.m. events. I do it because my audience is awake at that time and 4 a.m., to do it in the afternoon for me is 4 a.m. for someone in New York. That's not convenient if my audience is the U.S. But my non-negotiables may be that I don't want to work on Sabbath. Guess what? I'm not going to do an event on Friday night or Saturday or whatever. So know what you want to do and hold to that. People respect that. So that you don't resent what you're doing either. You're there to serve that audience, but you also have to serve your needs. You know, it sounds so bad. And I've heard people say this for years and it didn't register until I finally started doing it. When you give the audience the truth unvarnished without the BS, they love that because there's so much garbage out there already from other people anyway. So then when you finally tell people the whole story and the reasoning behind things and so on, they love you and they want more of you. And you don't have to really sell. I mean, yes, you're going to sell, but you don't have to push and manipulate and do all the crazy NLP things because it becomes natural. You know, I assume the sale. I assume that when someone comes into my room, they want to make a change. And I'll ask them, I say, how many of you here in the room, physical or digital, are here because you want to make a change? And they all raise their hand, which is kind of obvious because that's why they're there. 
And I say, great. Well, then guess what? You are already sold. The question really is, to what level do you want to participate with me? And can you find the money? End of conversation. Now the pressure's off. And once you're in that place, now it's serve and collaborate because you know they want to play. Now, will they all play? No, of course not. But you've got the elephant out of the bag. Everyone knows what's going on. They know that you have something further along the way. And they knew it when they came in anyway. I mean, if we're going to talk about Tony Robbins, for example, I knew going to Tony's UPW decades ago. Now, well, not decades, like 14, 15 years ago, that I was going to buy into his platinum partnership, which, which at that point was 65 grand. I knew it driving the four hours up the Florida Turnpike, I was buying that thing before I ever got there because someone told me about it. I kept trying to talk myself out of it, but I knew very well I was buying it. Your audience, a lot of them know they're buying from you before they've even started because they want the best of everything and they like you. You can take the pressure off and come from the place of assumptive close and therefore you include them and it works beautifully. It really, really does. Then you can relax and you don't have to fake things out. I love that. As you say, that presumptive close, they're coming because they like you, they trust you, and they want to work with you. Yes, they want a certain amount for free, but then they really, they know that they can only do so much by themselves. And at the end of the day, they really need the handholding, the support, the guidance, the authenticity behind what works, what doesn't work. Yeah, I love it. Drawing back that curtain of truth is so key. Ken, if our listeners wanted to find out more about you, your program, what you have to offer, how can they do that? Oh God, it's top secret. Um, (laughs) I (laughs) thought you'd never ask. What I like to do, and, and this by the way, is an important piece for your listeners as well. I've been teaching people how to be guests on podcasts. One of the things that you want to do is celebrate your podcast host. While you could go to amazingdigitalevents.com, which is our URL, if you're out running right now, or you're at the grocery store, or you're driving, you're not going to write that down. But if you go to Susan's website and you go to the show notes, we'll put a link in there and you'll be able to get an access to my book, Nice Guys Finish First. So go to the show notes, celebrate Susan and recognize her with the amazing value that she provides to you. Always celebrate, always celebrate your host. And she'll have the notes available. Nobody wants their audience to go someplace else. They always want them to come to read their website. Go to Susan's site. See how I promote you, Susan. Oh, you're um, lovely. I love yeah, it. Well, yeah, but, but, <laughs> Keep you know, it going. Well, you know, we talked about that before we went live with this. And it was like, I've taught people over in five-day challenges, which I now call sprints because there's enough challenge in our lives, you know, how to be the perfect podcast guest and how to get booked on podcasts because it really is critical that we promote. One of the ways we promote also is to do podcasts like this, is to be a guest. And then if you're a great guest, then the host will also pass you on to others. Because when this is over, just by the way, just a little FYI, I'm going to ask Susan if this has been great for you. Otherwise, has this been good for you so far? So far, don't let me down. I wouldn't think of it. (laughs) If it's been good for Susan, I'll say, listen, who else do you know that might be a good fit for me to be on their show? And then we get to leverage that. Always ask for who else you can serve. Again, if you do a good job and you're not pushy and you don't overstep and you celebrate your host, they're going to love to share that because it makes you unique. (laughs) It really does. Being nice is probably the best way to market yourself that you could ever be. I've walked up to so many airplanes, Susan, with bottles of champagne (laughs) from the flight attendants because they're like, well, you're so nice. Here's a bottle of champagne. I'm like, well, thank you. (laughs) I did. People were walking in my house and I had like cases of this cheap ass champagne that American Airlines used to serve. And they're like, what's this about? I said, well, I always made a challenge. Got to walk up with a bottle of champagne. And I did. So um, I never drank. I don't don't drink, but I could always give a bottle away. Hey, you got lots of gifts to give to people. I love it. Ken, this has been amazing. And listeners, I hope you've gotten at least one ounce of gold. But if not, Ken's going to share a golden nugget with us. So that make sure that you really have got it before he leaves. Ken, if you could leave our listeners with a golden nugget, what would that be? That's a hard one, Susan, because there's so many, but this is what's coming to mind right now. And that is that I'm going to leave you with two. First one is to take a page out of Harbecker's playbook and make sure that when you're selling your book, you can think about your book, not only as a lead magnet, but a giveaway for your event. Number one, Harv did that and made gazillions with Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. That's number one. Number two, when you're doing your events, 
understand that while your audience is really interviewing you to see whether or not they want to give you their money and their time and their trust, you are interviewing them too. You're looking at that audience and wondering who would be perfectly suited to be part of your coaching mastermind consulting program. And you're looking at who's got the right attitude, who's asking the right questions, who's participating, who looks like they're going to be fun to work with so that when you select them and you'll select them, I would love to have you actually interview them to decide who you want to work with. Then you're never working again. Then you get up in the morning and when you have a meeting with them, I have my Safari members I met with earlier today before this recording. Well, (laughs) yesterday, technically, it's a love affair. It's not like, oh God, there's that call again. It's like, oh, I can't wait. That makes a massive difference. Small events can be perfect for you because you get that level of connection and intimacy that you wouldn't get with a thousand people. They still can see you with the intimacy, but don't let the small events scare you. And I think those are the big ones. I could go forever with answering this, but I'll, I'll leave it there or you'll never, we'll never get done. And that feeds right into the whole idea of niche marketing, which both you and I share as being such a critical strategy for everyone to use. And in fact, that was the main theme of my author marketing mastery, which we just finished the beta course and we're going to be doing a brand new one in the new year. So yes, Ken, you've been amazing. Thank you so much for being a guest, sharing your wisdom, sharing your expertise. It's been amazing. Love reconnecting with you. And thank you all for taking time out of your precious day to listen to this interview. And I sincerely hope that it sparked some ideas you can use to sell more books. Here's wishing you much book marketing success. The time is now to take action and finally build your book selling empire. And the great news is that Susan is here to help you. Visit bookmarketingmentors.com and sign up for a free 15-minute book marketing strategy session with Susan. She'll help you discover your first steps to marketing and selling your book. Only those who take action are rewarded. So visit bookmarketingmentors.com and we'll see you again next week.